Did you know that on June 22nd, 1941, Hitler went for the invasion of the Soviet Union and codenamed it Operation Barbarossa, violating the two-year-old non-aggression deal between the two countries? The invasion was Germany's largest military action of World War II. We all know Hitler wasn't a good man, but he was a man of words. But what led him to get his hands on the Soviet Union, the world's most powerful allegiance at that time? If you're curious about all of this, you're in the right place. Hi, welcome to History Fun Facts, where we present some of the most amazing facts you might not have heard. Subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so you won't miss future updates. Without further ado, let's get straight into this. Adolf Hitler, director of Nazi Germany between 1933 and 1945, was born on April 20th, 1889 in Braunau, Austria, and died on April 30th, 1945 in Berlin, Germany. During World War I, he was injured and gassed while serving in the German army. He became the renamed National Socialists Nazi Party Chiefs of Publicity in 1920 and then the party's leader in 1921. Hitler rose to prominence after joining the German Workers' Party, which later became the Nazi Party in 1919. He quickly rose to the organization's top because of his oratory talents and propaganda tactics. Hitler rose to national prominence by exploiting instability during the Great Depression and he finished second in the presidential election in 1932. As a result of Hitler's many moves, the winner, Paul von Hindenburg, named him chancellor in January 1933. How it all started? Well, as World War II entered its second year, Adolf Hitler had always praised himself on the German-Soviet non-aggression pact of 1939 as a pragmatism. Still, anti-Bolshevism remained his most profound personal conviction. Following the Soviet takeover of Baltic states, Bessarabia in northern Bukovina in June 1940, which brought the Soviet forces closer to the Romanian oil reserves Germany so greatly relied on. So Hitler's long-standing desire to remove the Soviet regime was rekindled. He was increasingly wary of the Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin. He had realized he couldn't afford to wait until the subjugation of Western Europe was complete as he had planned before dealing with the Soviet Union. The invasion of the Soviet Union was initially planned for mid-May 1941, Still, the unexpected necessity of attacking Yugoslavia and Greece in April compelled them to postpone the Soviet campaign until late June. The speed in which Hitler won the Balkan battles allowed him to stick to his revised schedule. Still, the five-week delay cut into time available to carry out the invasion of the Soviet Union proper, which was all the more dangerous because the Russian winter arrived earlier than usual in 1941. Despite this, Hitler and the heads of the Oberkommando de Heers OKH or German Army High Command, namely the Army Commander-in-Chief Walter von Barokic and the Army General Staff Chief Franz Hodler were convinced that the Red Army could be defeated in two or three months and that by the end of October, the Germans would have conquered the entire European part of Russia and Ukraine west of a line stretching from Archangel. The invasion of the Soviet Union was first codenamed Operation Fritz, but as planning got underway, Hitler changed it to Operation Barbarossa after the Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick Barbarossa, who reigned from 1152 to 1190, and attempted to establish a German domination in Europe during that time. The Germans allocated about 150 divisions, totaling nearly 3 million men, to the campaign against the Soviet Union. There were 19 panzer divisions among these formations, and the Barbarossa force had over 3,000 tanks, 7,000 artillery pieces, and 2,500 aircraft in total. It was, in effect, the world's greatest and most powerful invasion army. More than 30 Finnish and Roman troop divisions were added to the German forces as well. Now, wars are fought with weapons and tanks. Did the Soviet Union have enough of them? The Soviet Union had twice or even three times the number as many tanks and planes as the Germans, but their planes were generally old and out of date. However, Soviet tanks were roughly equal to German tanks. The German intelligence service miscalculated the troop reserves that Stalin might summon from the depths of the USSR, which hampered Hitler's chances of victory even more. The Germans correctly assessed that there were approximately 150 divisions in the western sections of the USSR, with a further 50 divisions possibly being constructed. However, by the middle of August, the Soviets had raised almost 200 new divisions for 360. Because much of August was lost while Hitler and his aides debated what direction to take following their initial triumphs, the consequences of the miscalculations were amplified. Another aspect of the Germans' estimates was entirely political, but no less erroneous. 
They expected that the Soviet regime would collapse due to lack of internal support within three to six months of their invasion. Now this is where things get interesting. Three army groups, led by the same commanders as in the 1940 invasion of France, commenced the German onslaught on June 22, 1941. An army group led by General Wilhelm von Lieb struck from East Prussia into the Baltic Republics towards Leningrad to the north, which is now St. Petersburg. Another group, led by General Gerd von Rundstedt, and supported by an armor group led by General Paul Ludwig von Kleist, marched from southern Poland into the Ukraine into Kiev, where it was to turn southward to the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov beaches. Last but not least, in the center group, north of the Pripyat Marshes, General Fedor von Bock's army group, with one armored group under General Hermann Hoth and Heinz Guderian, thrust northeastward towards Smolensk and Moscow. The invasion, which took place along a 2,900 mile or 2,800 kilometer front, caught the Soviet leadership entirely off guard and left the Red Army unprepared and partially demobilized. Guderian's tanks, part of Bach's southern flank, raced 50 miles or 80 kilometers, passed the border on the first day of the invasion and arrived in Minsk 200 miles or 320 kilometers beyond it on June 27th. They converged at Minsk with Haas tanks, which had attacked from the north, but Bach's infantry could not follow up quickly enough to complete the encirclement of the Soviet troops in the area. Despite the 300,000 prisoners taken in the salient, a large portion of the Soviet forces was able to flee to the east. Unfortunately, by mid-July, a series of rainstorms had turned the sandy Russian roads into choking mud, over which the German transport vehicles following the tanks could only make plodding progress. The scorched earth tactic employed by the retreating Soviets handicapped the Germans as well. Soviet troops burned farmland, destroyed bridges, and evacuated factories in the face of the German advance. Entire steel and ammunition industries in the Soviet Union's westernmost regions were dismantled and carried by train to the east, where they were reassembled. The Soviets also destroyed or evacuated most of their rolling equipment like railroad cars, denying the Germans access to the Soviet rail system, denying Germans access to the Soviet rail system, since the Soviet railroad track was a different gauge than that of the German track, rendering German rolling stock worthless. Did the Germans fail? Despite this, the Germans had advanced more than 400 miles or 640 kilometers by mid-July and were only 200 miles or 320 kilometers from Moscow. Still, they had plenty of time to make significant gains before the arrival of winter, but they squandered it. Owing to disagreements between Hitler and the OKH throughout August on the direction of the next thrusts. Rather than focusing on Moscow, Hitler wanted the primary effort to be directed southeastward via Ukraine and the Donetsk Basin into the Caucasus with a modest swing northwestward into Leningrad to join Lieb's army group. How about Ukraine? Was Ukraine an enemy or an ally? Meanwhile, Rundstedt and Kleist had dispatched the main Soviet fortifications in Ukraine despite the latter's superiority. By the end of July, the new Soviet front of Kiev had been broken, and the Germans surged down to the Black Sea mouths of the Bug and Dnieper rivers to join Romania's simultaneous advance. Kleist was then instructed to wheel north from central Ukraine and Guderian south from Smolensk in preparation for a pincer operation around Soviet forces behind Kiev. By the end of September, the encircling movement's claws had grabbed 520,000 soldiers. These massive encirclements were partially the fault of inept Soviet high commanders and partially the fault of Stalin, who as commander-in-chief defied his general's advice and ordered his forces to stand and fight instead of retreating eastward, regrouping in preparation for a counteroffensive. As the German drive against Moscow slowed, General Gregory Konstantinovich Zhukov, the Soviet commander on the Moscow front, launched the first great counteroffensive on December 6th, striking box right in the Elets and Tula sectors, south of Moscow in his center in the Klin and Kalinin, now Tiver, sectors in the northwest. Siberian troops were wisely used in the offensives, who were exceptionally adept combatants in freezing conditions. A blow was delivered to the German left in the Velikai Luki sector. The counteroffensive, which quickly evolved into a triple convergence on Smolensk, was maintained throughout the winter of 1941 and 42. In August of 1941, Operation Barbarossa began to falter and its defeat was obvious as the Soviet counteroffensive began. Even though the Red Army suffered more casualties than the Germans during the battle, Germany's inability to destroy the Soviet Union was a severe setback for the German military effort. What do you think the important factors were that led Hitler to go to war against the Soviet Union? 
And how could all of this been avoided? Let us know in the comments section. If you found this video interesting, please give it a huge thumbs up. And don't forget to share this video with your friends and family. And thanks for watching.